Okay, up there. Good. Okay, so we, can't, we talk about stability analysis, and I'm going to give you, um, let's say, a quick rundown or uh, an, an overview of the tools of stability. Uh, and I deliberately threw in that, modern, uh, that, that, that adjective modern. It's a little bit daring because it could be not more than you know, a year from now. But nevertheless, I'm trying to somehow uh, connect what you might know from a fluids course or a hydrodynamic stability course and connect that one to the complexity of things that we have to actually deal with in terms of stability theory. Okay? But uh, to start out with, um, let me just uh, give you a few, a little bit of a, of a, of a motivation before I hit you. Uh, with, with some equations. So fluid instability, is, it's a, it's a, a stability theory is a central discipline of, of, of fluid mechanics. You know, just open JFM and so there's always a stability analysis somewhere in every issue. So fluid instabilities are all around us. Everywhere you look, there's a, you can see a fluid instability. Uh, they appear on all spatial and temporal scales. Okay, from the small one, microfluidics, all the way to the atmospheric sciences and uh, oceanography or astrophysical applications. And they're caused by a multitude of phenomena. Okay, I'm going to show you a few examples on the next slides. And they also have a great impact on technologies and environment. We do have to care about instabilities because they really limit an operational range of a fluid device or some, uh, you know, they are responsible for safety margins of certain uh, certain devices and so on. Okay, so here are just a bunch of examples of fluid instabilities, and I'm going to write down what the, sort of the main component of that one is. So the most common ones are probably uh, shear-induced instabilities. So we have the UDY, which causes um, a positive feedback in the flow that creates some patterns. For example, that Kelmold's in, uh, Kelmold, Kelvin Helmholtz instability of that lenticular cloud hanging over a mountain. A little bit more from a simulation. This is the uh, Rayleigh shear instabilities of a rotating disk. Uh, we're sitting on an instability as we speak. So this is a thermally driven instability of the core mantle, con uh, the earth mantle convection. Okay, so this is a stability instability going on all the time in the core of the of the of the earth. So this would be the same one for a laboratory experiment. Rayleigh Binar convection, a very famous one with the hexagonal patterns. That's an instability that is thermally induced. Okay, interfacial instability is the breakup, very classical one of a capillary jet into little drops. That one can be written as an instability of a columnar a columnar jet. Okay, and then you can push that one quite far. You know, two colliding jets make this fishbone instability uh, that is also interfacial in nature. Okay. Free surface instabilities, this is a capillary wave propagation. That one is an instability on the free surface waves. And you can even go to non-traditional fluid applications and do the sand dune ripple formation and, and uh, describe that one as an instability on the sand dune. Okay. Then uh, we also have uh, magnetically driven instability. In that case, the magnetic field is the main player in that instability. So this is a ferrofluid, which has surface instabilities. You put a magnet underneath. It's very popular in uh, science museums to, for kids to play with. Uh, but on a more larger scale, this is a MHD instability of a tokamak plasma. Okay, and then actually these instabilities, there's plenty of them, and they're very, very tough to, to, uh, to, uh, to control. Uh, the instabilities, the magnetically induced instabilities in that MHD, tokamak plasma, is probably the main reason why we do not have uh, nuclear fusion at the moment. Okay, just getting those uh, in check is, is, the, is the main challenge, among many others, but it's one of the main challenges. Okay. This is a buoyancy-driven instability. This is lock exchange flow. You have two different fluids. The heavy one goes underneath the light one and then creates these homo instabilities for a lock exchange flow. And you can also scale that one up from a lab experiment. This is a, this is a, a, a picture of Lake Geneva, and there is a buoyancy instability there that is responsible for nutrient transport in, uh, in Lake Geneva. If you go really high up in, uh, in Reynolds numbers, then you can also have rotationally driven instabilities. The spiral galaxy and accretion disks are just full of instabilities. Uh, the spiral arms that are forming are manifestations of a rotational instability. 
and for example the the spot the red spot on Jupiter is uh, certain in instability uh, also morphological instabilities that's not what we really think about an in instability but if you have a gradient in some kind of a chemical uh, concentration in that case it's calcium uh, you got actually the formation of stalagmites and stalactites in, in caves is a very slow instability, but nevertheless, it's a morphological instability. Okay? Same thing goes for uh, the thing that's called penitentes. These are uh, ice, ice sculptures, so to speak, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Andes. Uh, they're about two meters high. You can walk in between them if you dare to do so. And there, that's a radiative sublimation instability that actually forms the, the, the penitentus and sets the scales in the spatial directions. And finally, you know, combustion instability. In that case, of course, it's reactive flow. You have all kind of uh, instabilities on that one. All right, so before we talk about uh, stability, let me also introduce the stability concepts because stability has been around for a long time. It has been treated mathematically, not just by the fluid dynamicists. So uh, what do we usually understand or, or how do we define stability, okay? So the definition of stability is usually given in a context of a dynamical system. We have x dot is equal to f of x, f is nonlinear, and then we have some kind of an equilibrium point. That could be an exact equilibrium point or a quasi-equilibrium point. Okay? And then we're going to follow a small perturbation about this equilibrium state. So we're going to zoom in onto this equilibrium state and see what happens if we deviate just a little bit from it. And then the classical pictures in the, all the physics textbooks is like this. Okay? So we have a bowl like this. You displace it here. The bottom is an equilibrium point. If you displace that one, it rolls down the bowl and returns to its, its equilibrium. It's stable. If it's unstable, it rolls off and it's indifferent or neutrally stable if you can just push it back and forth and it stays there. Okay, so this is a little bit of an intuitive way of describing the stability of an equilibrium point. The person that somehow first mathematized the whole concept is uh, Lapunov. Okay, he also started out with a dynamical system, x dot is f of x of t, with an equilibrium point, just like before. And then he wrote a paper in 1892 uh, that, uh, that suggested two stability concepts. Okay, so there's Lapunov 1 and there's Lapunov 2, both in the same paper. And Lapunov 1, this is the mathematical definition, says if we start out somewhere a delta away from the, from the, from the equilibrium point, we're going to stay in an epsilon for all times. Okay? That's the definition of stability. We're not, we're not moving away. We could move away, but we're not really shooting off very far. Okay? So you have a delta neighborhood and an epsilon neighborhood. This is where you start out. This is where you end up in the worst possible case. Okay? That one is called Lapunov stable. The second one is if we return for time to infinity, we return to the equilibrium point eventually. So in that case, that epsilon is going to zero. We're actually returning back. Okay, it's a special case. Then we're saying we're asymptotically stable. Okay? And that paper actually had a, quite an impact because it first formalized a stability concept on which you can actually build all kind of mathematical theories. Okay? But you should notice two, two, uh, one thing in both, in both definitions. Okay, this is for all t, and this is t to infinity. Okay, so for all t and t to infinity basically means there is no time scale in the stability definition. Okay, we, as long as this thing eventually returns back to the equilibrium state, we're going to consider it stable. Otherwise, it's unstable. Okay. So then, of course, this got picked up immediately. You know, it was a very successful paper. Nowadays, you would say it's highly cited. Okay? Uh, and it was translated for fluid systems. Okay? So we have an equilibrium state. That would be our base flow. Okay? That's our equilibrium state. And then we're going we're gonna to have a small perturbation around that one. So we go an epsilon away. And we just look at the dynamics of the perturbations Q. Okay. And for small epsilon, they're governed by the Jacobian. 
and the Jacobian are our linearized Navier-Stokes equations. If you want to modify them, uh, you can actually bring them into a, a nicer form, and then they're known as the Orsomophile equations. Okay, so we have an evolution equation for the Jacob uh, with the Jacobian as the system matrix. And then if you throw in the Lapunov stability concept, okay, that one is equivalent to saying, you know, I'm going to have e to the minus i omega t because I have exponential uh, instabilities. Okay, and then the whole thing turns into an eigenvalue problem for the stability of the system. Okay, here's the eigenvalue problem. The DDT turns into an i omega. That's an eigenvalue problem. And then you just look at the imaginary part of omega here that makes it either exponentially grow or exponentially decay. Okay, so the eigenvalues of L are what tells you the stability. And that's exactly what we always do when we linearize uh, a dynamical system. Okay. Now, if you, if you do that one, if you look at, if you form your linearized Navier-Stokes equations and look at the eigenvalues, the largest growth, let's just say a simple flow like channel flow, okay? The and then you crank up the Reynolds number as high as you can. Eventually, this will go stable because it has no inflection point. So there has to be a Reynolds number where you get the maximum growth, okay? And that Reynolds number is ridiculously high, first of all. It's in the I believe it's in the 19,000s or something like that. Okay. And if you take the worst possible growth rate you can have there and stick that one in, it's a growth rate that is so small that you have to go 50 channel heights downstream for the amplitude to just double. Okay. So this is, this is about as bad as it can get in the channel flow. Okay. So, Obviously, this is not a very useful tool to analyze channel flow. And the trick for you know, making it a little bit more realistic is we need to somehow reintroduce a time scale. We cannot have that t to infinity or for, for all time constraint on the, on the stability because the most flows that we, that we actually look at don't give a perturbation an infinite time horizon to do what they need to do. Things will change on a much, much faster time scale. Okay, so we have to reintroduce the time scale for a more general and a more realistic stability analysis. All right, so that brings me to the mathematical framework that allows us to do that in the most flexible way that we can imagine. Okay, so for that one, I'm going to take my fluid system. Okay, and I'm going to. I'm not going to throw too many equations at you. I just sort of symbolize the equations. Everybody has different equations, incompressible, compressible, multiphase, whatever you have, okay, reactive flows. So this is my fluid system, okay, and I treat it as an input-output system. So that means I somehow define the things I have control over. That's my input. And that could be an initial condition, it could be a forcing from the outside, it could be a roughness distribution, it could be the placement of a bump somewhere, it could be anything that you consider a control variable of the fluid system. Okay. Then it goes through the fluid system, the fluid system does what it does, and then on the output side I measure something, and that something is just a number, a scalar. Okay. The drag, the dissipation, the Nusselt number, whatever you have, okay? That's my output. So then, by learning more about the problem, I'm gonna say, okay, I want to write this down as an optimization problem. I want to make this output, the drag, for example, as large or as small as I can by playing around with my control variable, okay? So this turns into an uh, uh, objective uh, definition. So my, my, uh, my objective, which is a function of the state and my control, needs to be optimized, minimum or maximum. I don't really care about that. Okay? But I cannot just optimize into the blue. I have to also satisfy my governing equations. Okay? So this is the constraint. I have to be truthful to my Navier-Stokes equations, but within that constraint, I want to do as best as I can. Okay. And that one is a PDE constraint optimization. Now, constraint optimizations are notoriously hard to solve. Okay. What we usually do is we like to have one expression that we optimize rather than saying this is what we optimize, but we also have a second equation that needs to be, that needs to be satisfied. We want to lump the two together, and that one 
is done by adding our constraint, which is a full equation, okay, uh, with a Lagrange multiplier to combine these two things all together and then optimize it in one shot. Okay? So this is a standard trick to turn a constraint optimization into now an unconstrained optimization where the constraint is just added with a Lagrange multiplier and this Q plus is my Lagrange multiplier. That's the one that satisfies the constraint or, or makes sure the constraint is, is taken into account. All right, so now this L, which is known as the augmented Lagrangian, okay, now depends on three variables, the Q, the U, and we introduced another variable, the Q plus, okay? Three variables, and we have to optimize this expression, okay? Now, if you have a function with three variables, the way you do that to get the minimum or a maximum, you take the derivative with respect to all three variables and set each one zero. Now, this works exactly the same way here. We take the first derivative, but since we're not taking a derivative with respect to an uh, uh, independent variable, we take it with respect to a function we have to take variations, okay? But it's the same idea. So I take dl dq plus, dl dq, and dl du, that's my three variables of L, and I set all of them to zero to satisfy the constraint that this has to be a minimum or a maximum, okay? And just like with functions, you get three expressions for these three, um, for these three uh, 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 conditions. Okay, so here is our, our uh, Lagrangian, okay? And now out of this one come three equations. Now, if you have a function, you usually get algebraic equations. Okay? But because we're doing variations, in this case, we actually get equations, not just algebraic expressions, okay? So the first one is the simplest one. I have to differentiate L up here with respect to Q plus. Well, Q plus only appears here. And if you differentiate with respect to Q plus, it doesn't, it doesn't appear anywhere else, and it happens to be linear. So this whole thing acts just like a coefficient, okay? So taking the derivative with respect to Q plus is just this coefficient, which is a function all by itself. And sure enough, it's the function that we had in the beginning. So nothing is learned at that moment. This is, this is just bringing back the governing equations and saying, you have to satisfy that. We knew that, okay? Gets a little bit more complicated for the second one. So now we're doing the dl dq, and we see that q appears here, here as a time derivative, and here inside the f, okay? So in that case, we have to do a little bit of more work that one uses integration by parts, but it's not so bad. And then you get an equation that looks like this. Q plus dot dF dQ H Q plus dH dQ. So this is the part from differentiating the Q in here. That's the H component. That's the F component. And that one is the Q plus component from the multiplication of these two terms. Okay? So three equations, uh, uh, three terms in that equation. So we see that we get our original evolution equation back, but now we also get an equation for the Lagrange multiplier. That one has its own equation. And that thing is called the adjoint equation, okay? The adjoint equation. Because the Lagrange multipliers are also known as the adjoint variables, okay? Final uh, derivative we have to take is the LDU is equal to zero, okay? Now, U appears here, twice here in H, and it also is inside the F, okay? Now, it is not anywhere contributing here. That's the only one that has time derivatives, okay? So no contribution from here. That's why this last equation will not be an evolution equation. It will be an algebraic equation, no time derivative, okay? And this is how it looks like. Okay, the HDU, which is the part from here, the FDU is the part from here multiplied by Q plus. That one is the optimality condition. So out of these, satisfying these three things together to get an optimum, we have to satisfy these three equations. Two of them are evolution equations. One we knew, 
One is uh, one we knew before, and the other one is a, is a new one that we just derived, and plus one algebraic equation at the end. Okay? Now, strictly speaking, these three equations have to be satisfied simultaneously. Okay? So, having this one satisfied simultaneously means we have to solve these three equations all lumped together in one shot. Okay? Nobody does that. The way we do that is we do it iteratively. Okay? So we say, okay, let's back off on the simplest equation. That's the easy one. That doesn't need to be evolved. That just needs to be evaluated. Okay? That one is going to be, uh, we're going to solve this equation exactly. We're going to solve this equation exactly the way it is. And on the last one, we iterate. Okay? So exact, exact, approximate. That's how we do it. Okay? And by going around and around in an iterative scheme, we eventually solve the last one also exactly. Okay? So here is what we do. We have our governing equations. For the first time in you, we have no idea, we just guess something. If you don't have a good guess, zero is as good as anything else to start with. Okay? So we solve that equation. Then we solve the second equation. Okay, for my adjoint. Okay, so we solve that equation. I'm going to show you how to get that equation in, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Okay, and then, so the Q plus that comes out of here then goes into the third equation. The HDU is this one. So the solution here that I need to evaluate that one, all these terms are from the equation. This is what just came out of the equation here. I stick that one in here evaluate that one, and then look what we have here. The H du. H is what we want to achieve, and U is what we want to achieve it with. So this is a gradient that we need to improve our H. Okay? This is exactly the gradient we need for the next time to do better. Okay? So this the H du is a gradient that goes into your favorite optimization routine as the gradient, and then it tells us, okay, if you want to have a better H, go down or up the gradient, that gives you a better U, and next time around you have a better guess than you had before, you go through that cycle again until you get another gradient, and you go around and around and around and around until that gradient is going to zero, as it should, and then it says, okay, you just climbed a hill or you're down in a valley. This is your optimum. Okay? All right. Now, this was in all generality. Okay? So we're no longer restricted to linear time invariant systems or Floquet systems of any kind. Okay? I have not specified F. I have not said it has to be linear. We, need, we didn't need that one. Okay. I didn't have to say this is autonomous in time. It can be time varying. It can be anything you want to. So at the moment, we're totally free to use F or H. Okay. So both the equation can be anything you want to and what you're after can be anything you want to. Okay. So we can treat time periodic flows, for example, turbo machinery, blade passing, okay. pulmonary flow, hemodynamics, time varying, inlet flow, ramp up flows. Okay. You, have, you can have nonlinear flows. This F can be nonlinear. I'm going to show you an example later on where we have a nonlinear flow. Okay. Mixing. They can even be stochastic with some uncertainty thrown in. Okay. You have to formulate it a tiny little bit differently to go statistical, but nevertheless, that framework can more or less handle anything you throw at it. The optimization may be difficult, but certainly you can write down uh, in all generality, what you would like to know about your fluid system. All right, so these Lagrange multipliers here, that's the new concept, okay? So suddenly we're getting a second equation that wasn't there before. So we have to ask ourselves, was this just a math trick to get the optimization going, or do these equations, this second evolution equation for the adjoint, is there something in there that we can actually use all by itself. Okay? What, is, what is the role of these Lagrange multipliers? 
Now, the Lagrange, the, the adjoint variables, all the variables that are needed in here are independent flow fields. They have their own evolution equation. And that evolution equation looks a little bit like the Navier-Stokes equations, although not quite. Okay? And what they do is they provide sensitivity and gradient information because that, that output from the adjoint variable went straight not quite straight, but, you know, multiplied into our gradient expression at the end. So they must have something to do with a gradient, with sensitivities. Okay. So let me, let me uh, bring that home a little bit more. Okay. Let's say I have my, my cost here that I'm going to abbreviate as I, and I'm going to make a small change to my equations. Okay, so instead of Q dot minus F, Q and U, I'm going to add a little bit of a forcing term on the right hand side. Okay, that could be some bump on the wall, that could be a free stream perturbation, that could be a gust that comes by, anything you want to. But it's going to be external. Okay, so if I, of course, if I change something here, it will shake off my, my, uh, my cost functional here and the Lagrange in there as well. Okay? That's one way of doing a small perturbation. The second one, so it's an additive perturbation. The second one I can do is I can do an internal perturbation. I don't add anything to the equation on the right-hand side. I mess up the terms in the equation. Okay? So my small f, f is actually multiplied by Q. Somewhere in here, I make a small change, and that could be I change the Reynolds number up by a percent, okay? or I change the mean flow a little bit, or I change the Mach number, I change the geometry. I'm going to show you some examples later on. Okay? So this is an internal where I mess with the equations. This is an external where I leave the equations and add something to it. Multiplicative, additive. It doesn't matter. If you, if you cancel all the ones out here that cancel, you know, so the Q dot F cancels the I because that's how we computed it. Okay? you actually get a link between the changes you make to the effect it has on the output. Okay? So this is the change I make additively. This is the piece I add. And this is how it imp impacts my drag, for example. Okay? And you see that the proportionality between what I perturb it with and what the result is, is Q+. Plus. So it acts as the proportionality between, uh, between input and output. So the higher Q+, plus, the more I will mess up my drag. Okay? So if I look at the Q+, plus field all by itself, it immediately identifies, oh, if you do a small perturbation here, it will have a huge effect on drag. If you do it here, nobody cares, right? And where it's zero, I can do whatever I want to. It will not have any impact on the drag. 